The Illustrated Fountainhead, Serializing a Classic Novel, by Tom Bowden. Published on New Ideal, the journal of the Ayn Rand Institute, October 12, 2022. On May 7, 1943, as World War II raged across the globe, Ayn Rand's novel, The Fountainhead, was published in America. Due to sparse reviews and minimal publicity, sales were initially low. Then an unusual thing happened. Paralleling Rand's description of the gradual success of the novel's hero, Howard Rourke, quote, It was as if an underground stream flowed through the country and broke out in sudden springs that shot to the surface at random in unpredictable places, end quote. As word-of-mouth readership spread, Rand's novel began appearing on bestseller lists more than a year after publication. By May 1945, it was number one on the Los Angeles Times local bestseller list, and by August it had reached number six on the New York Times national bestseller list, remaining on that list, with few interruptions, until March 1946. Sensing a commercial opportunity, the syndication company King Features approached Rand in mid-1945 proposing an illustrated condensation of the Fountainhead to be published in newspapers worldwide. It would be part of a series of such condensations that the company had launched in 1942 and planned to resume after an eight-month hiatus due to wartime paper shortages. Rand enthusiastically embraced this opportunity for international publicity, bringing to bear the skills and insights she had developed for many years of writing screenplays, dramas, and novels. Even though the condensation would contain only 7% of the words she had spent years carefully shaping into a challenging novel of ideas, she was delighted with the results. Here's how it happened. Warning. Plot spoilers ahead. Negotiation. A condensation true to the theme. I like the idea, Rand told her agent, Alan Collins, upon learning of the syndicate's proposal. But as one would expect from the creator of the uncompromising Howard Rourke, she insisted on having full advance approval of visualization, outline, and content. My only interest in such a strip is the publicity it would give my book, she explained to Collins. Therefore, it must be the right kind of publicity, a condensation true to the theme, style, and spirit of the story. If the condensation makes the book appear garbled, weak, or pointless, through careless choice of incidents, it will do positive harm in discouraging prospective readers. She also insisted that Rourke's courtroom speech be included. Noting her inexperience with syndication, she added, I hope King Features won't find this unreasonable. King Features had approached Collins with its proposal in July 1945, offering $1,000 as a guaranteed advance against 50% of syndication income. King Features would hire the writer and artist and pay all costs of syndication. By August 1945, as negotiations continued, King Features raised its guarantee to $1,500, proposing 25 daily installments with 500 words each, a total of 12,500 words, while insisting that the courtroom speech be limited to one installment. Rand was initially disappointed with the space allotted for the speech. Quote, I could do a swell job of condensing Rourke's speech into 1,000 words. That's what I did for the screenplay version, she told Collins. But on reflection, she conceded that two days of a rhetorical speech might be too much for this kind of condensation. Rand was willing to allow the syndication's in-house writer to make the necessary narrative choices for condensing the novel. Quote, I think they can do a good job of it, she told Collins, if the writer keeps his narrative as hard and simple as possible and goes easy on the adjectives. Rand, who had much experience writing synopses and scenarios for Hollywood studios, said that if the deal went through, she wanted to send specific suggestions and advice to the writer. Quote, I know all the tricks of how these things get done. I hope the deal does go through, she wrote to Collins. I'm curious to see the thing illustrated. The deal did go through. King Features accepted all of Rand's conditions. By contract, she acquired the right to approve the artist's proposed visualizations of the characters, to approve a general outline of the scenes, and to approve and edit every word of the condensation. She was also guaranteed that Rourke's courtroom speech would occupy at least one day of the series. Condensation, the toughest part of a tough job. Unlike an ordinary comic strip, which includes word balloons and written descriptions inside the comic panel, the King Features approach was to display a wordless, three-panel comic strip with a brief caption beneath each panel, accompanied by long passages condensed from the novel itself. The task of condensing Rand's 754-page novel into a mere 12,500 words, roughly 50 such pages, 
fell to a King Features writer named Fred Dickinson. On October 18th, about six weeks after the contract was finalized, Dickinson sent his first batch of drafts to Rand for review. Quote, You will not, I am sure, be surprised to learn that it is one of the most difficult condensation jobs in the 20 bestsellers I've done, Dickinson wrote. I'd be glad to have you make any editing changes you think necessary. The only thing to remember is that anything added one place must be subtracted elsewhere in the same strip, as these are written to fill space exactly. The surviving correspondence in the Ayn Rand archives does not indicate what edits Rand made to the first two batches, but there were surely some, because Dickinson subsequently asked Rand to include two carbon copies along with her rewrites, so that he wouldn't have to retype them for the printer and the artist. Rand made substantial edits to the third batch, explaining her reasoning in a letter to Dickinson. Quote, I have made changes mainly to clarify the very complex psychologies and motivations which we need here in order to make the final tragedy understandable. End quote. These installments covered Dominique Franken's marriage to Gail Winand, as well as Rourke's budding friendship with Winand. She closed that letter with a salute to her fellow writer. Quote, All my best wishes to you and my sympathy for the toughest part of a tough job our last two weeks copy. In her edits to the fourth batch, Rand deleted parts that were inessential to the progression of the story, so as to make space that was badly needed for the exposition of Rourke's motives in agreeing to design Cortland. Unless Rourke's reasons are made clear, Rand explained, his dynamiting of the building will appear as an act of senseless brutality. She ended up reworking all of chapter 19 and the beginning of chapter 20 and in chapter 24, she inserted the issue behind the public fury against Rourke because, quote, otherwise the readers won't understand the trial, nor Rourke's speech. Rand had left Dickinson's continuity and choice of incidents, complimenting him for an excellent job of selecting in what was probably the hardest part of the book to condense. Rand herself condensed Rourke's courtroom speech, a task that was more challenging because it needed to be even shorter than she expected. King Feature's first proposal was for a total of 25 daily installments, containing 500 words each, for a total of 12,500 words. But at some point, the number of installments expanded from 25 to 30, while keeping the total word count at 12,500. That meant each daily installment would hold only 417 words on average. In her letter transmitting the condensed speech to Dickinson, she wrote, It contains exactly 407 words. I've counted them. This is the best I can do. I was supposed originally to have 500 words for the purpose. The speech itself can't be cut any further and present any semblance of the book's theme. To make it fit, Rand had cut almost 90% of the speech. Visualization. Nothing but the bare essentials. Rand was keen to ensure that the serialization would be true to her artistic vision, not only in the story's condensation, but also in its visualization. Before signing the contract, Rand reviewed samples of previous King Feature serializations. These samples must have included some drawn by Harold Hal Foster, whose Prince Valiant comic strip had debuted in 1937, because we know that Rand expressed an initial preference for him or someone with a still harder and simpler style of drawing. However, King Features ended up retaining Frank Godwin, a comic strip artist with decades of experience. Calling Godwin a leading illustrator, Dickinson told Rand that we have been at some pains to get him. Just as the project was getting underway, Rand and her husband, Frank O'Connor, arrived by train in New York City from their home in the San Fernando Valley area of Los Angeles for an extended stay. This allowed Rand to schedule personal meetings with both Dickinson, October 4th, and Godwin, October 10. In these meetings, Rand probably shared the essential points on artwork she had previously written to her agent. The illustrations, Rand had told Collins, should be kept simple, explaining, My whole book is done by understatement and I'd like the strip done the same way, if possible. It should be hard, simple, clear-cut, stylized, underdrawn, nothing but the bare essentials, as uncluttered as possible. Rand's contract gave her the right to approve in advance the artist's proposed visualization of the characters, before the actual drawing of the strip. Presumably, Godwin's vision for the serial passed muster, as there is no evidence that Rand vetoed or required changes to any of Godwin's illustrations, except as her text edits required him to prepare different illustrations. So, for example, textual changes to chapters 19 and 20, described above, necessitated four new images. I suggest the following pictures for chapter 19, she wrote to Dickinson. A scene of Keating begging Tui for help. A scene between Rourke and Keating. A scene where Tui laughs at the drawings brought to Keating. 
The final product includes two of these scenes, executed by Godwin just as Rand had suggested, and another that was consistent with her guidance. For the first image in chapter 20, Rand suggested a good picture of Rourke, Wynand, and Dominique on the shore of the lake, or of Wynand and Dominique at the fireplace. Godwin chose the first option. For the very last illustration of the series, Rand asked that Godwin show just the figure of Rourke against the sky. I would like so much to see it ended that way. Again, Godwin complied. A month before the serial was released, Rand saw proofs for the first week's installment. The drawings are fine, she told Dickinson, and I was very pleased with the look of the whole thing as set up. Culmination. A swell job on an incredibly difficult undertaking. On December 2nd, Rand wrote to Ross Baker, sales manager at Bob's Merrill, the Fountainhead's publisher, Wait till you see the King Features condensation with the drawings. I've seen the advanced proofs of the first week. It's excellent. Noting that the first installment was scheduled to begin publication December 24th, she described it as a nice Christmas present for us. Rand was especially pleased with the description of the Fountainhead that appeared above the illustration panel for all 30 installments. Did you notice their caption for the story? She wrote to Baker based on the great best-selling novel of a man who dared to pit his genius against the world. They did that. I had nothing to do with it. I never discussed the subject of a caption with them and never saw it until I received the proofs. There is what I considered good salesmanship. They knew it was a man's story, and they stressed its real theme in a dramatic way. Rand very much liked Godwin's drawings. Tell the family to look for the illustrated condensation of the Fountainhead in the Hearst papers beginning December 24th, wrote Rand to her niece Mimi Sutton. I think they'll get a kick out of it, because the artist has done a wonderful job of making Rourke look like Frank. I've seen the advanced proofs, and everybody here gasps seeing them, without any warning from us. Why, it's Frank! Rand later asked Dickinson to send her an additional set of proofs for a friend, and she identified four drawings that she wanted to frame for the walls of her study. Rand experienced the illustrated fountainhead in the pages of the Los Angeles Evening Herald Express beginning on December 24th, 1945. It also appeared in 35 other newspapers in such cities as New York, Chicago, Detroit, Baltimore, and San Francisco, and abroad in Caracas, Venezuela, La Paz, Bolivia, and Buenos Aires. The series was designed to appear six days a week, Monday through Saturday, for five consecutive weeks. In the first three months of 1946, the condensation brought in gross revenues of $5,473.75, fully justifying the syndicate's 1,500 advance to Rand. Rand and Dickinson closed out the project with expressions of mutual respect. It's been grand working with you, Dickinson wrote to Rand. You are now a newspaper woman with a byline on your first article. No mean feat. Rand, in turn, offered Dickinson her compliments and thanks, adding, You've done a swell job on an incredibly difficult undertaking, so pin a little medal on yourself from at least one grateful author. In March 1946, Rand wrote to Dickinson, I enjoyed very much watching the strip run here in the Los Angeles Herald Express. On the first day, they announced it with a headline across the bottom of their front page. I thought that was really swell of them. I enjoyed being a newspaper woman with a byline for 30 days, courtesy of Fred Dickinson. I always wanted to be a newspaper woman anyway.